welcome. Thank you for coming out today. I'm Professor James Joseph Dean, the chair of the sociology department. I just wanted to give some brief introductory remarks uh, regarding Professor Charmas. So after 41 years of service to Sonoma State, Kathy Charmas will be sorely missed as she ends her time here, but continues to write and lecture across the country and internationally. Professor Charmas has been a longtime member of the sociology department and the director of the faculty writing program for over four decades. And we in the sociology department wanted to mark her time here with the last lecture. In addition to her teaching across the fields of medical sociology, death and dying, social psychology, Kathy has been a prolific scholar. After five years of working on her second edition of Constructing Grounded Theory, her widely cited book on qualitative methodology. It was published in 2014 and has been translated into several different languages. In addition, and also in 2014, she co-edited a four-volume set on grounded theory and situational analysis for Sage Publishing, Benchmarks, and Social Research. Kathy has been a leading scholar in the fields of medical sociology, symbolic interactionism, and grounded theory methodology since the start of her career in the 70s. Her first monograph, Good Days, Bad Days, The Self and Chronic Illness in Time, was published in 1991 and received the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interactionism Award for Best Book. That came after her textbook that she had published in the 80s entitled The, Soci the Social Reality of Death. Today's talk draws on Kathy Sharmas' contribution to a qualitative analysis demonstration project with five psychologists, which culminated in the book entitled Five Ways of Doing Qualitative Analysis, Phenomenological Psychology, Grounded Theory, Discourse Analysis, Narrative Research, and Intuitive Inquiry. Her talk today is entitled Losing and Regaining a Valued Self. And now without further ado, I welcome Professor Kathy Charmas. Thank you all for coming and for having me give this lecture. Um, I want to tell you that um, I gave the faculty about two or three topics, and James and Melinda chose this one. So if you like it, you can tell me, and if you don't like it, you can blame them. <laughs> now, for the students, this lecture may um, cause you to reach because James asked me to talk about theory as well. So I'm going to talk about theorizing as well as the um, topic. And I do want to give full credit to my colleagues in psychology. This came out of a psychology project. Um, it started with a symposium at the American Psychological Association. And we each analyzed the same data. Um, all these folks. And I did the grounded theory. Uh, Fred Wirtz, who spearheaded the project from that first symposium to the final book, um, always, he said he always thought I was really a psychologist. Well, I'm really not. I'm a social psychologist from sociology. And that does imprint everything I do. Uh, some of you are sociology majors, no doubt. I hope that some of you are psychology majors as well, because there's real uh, connections between the two areas. So bear with me and reach for the theoretical and we'll start. Okay, so I'm going to start with a story. And some of you who have had a very ill or badly injured sibling, close friend, um, early in life may empathize with this. Uh, this is a statement by a young woman and when she was 19, she got anaplastic cancer, which is very serious. Most people don't live beyond three or four years. Um, and by the time it's diagnosed, it's metastasized, as hers has. But she's still alive, and she's now in her 30s, in her late 30s. Um, she's really quite amazing. But she's a very um, unique young woman in a sense, because here she is with this terrible gash on her throat, affecting her talk, affecting her singing. Her whole life had been preparation 
to be a mezzo-soprano um, opera singer. She sacrificed everything to become a singer. <clears throat> it's very similar to an athlete who sacrifices everything for baseball or, or basketball or whatever uh, sport the person is in, that everything revolves around that one activity. And she was a particularly um, interesting young woman. <clears throat> Her father was raised in South America, in Venezuela, and uh, she had a lot of conflict. Her mom was from the Philippines. Her family was devoutly Catholic, and no matter what the dad did, mom accepted it. And then they had this very independent young American girl and then woman who um, did not take dad's words as gospel, <clears throat> fought with him constantly. He hated the notion, apparently, of her becoming a singer, said she could never make a living, uh, discouraged her. Uh, each step along the way, and she thoroughly resented him. And she talked herself as being known about the fat kid with the oppressive dad that had no friends. So she had a difficult growing up. It was hard. So here she is, and she says, my voice is gone, so I was gone, and I've never been anything but my voice. That's how she connected with people, connected with the world. And so, <clears throat> This is how um, I analyzed it. We named her Teresa. Her real name is Emma Linda McSpadden. She's now an author of the book, and she wrote a response to each one of our, um, our chapters and what we said as research analysts about her um, documents, her story, her personal story, and the, and the interview. <clears throat> and notice I repeated that. My voice was gone. And this is how I saw it. Her voice is merged with herself. They were just like this, woven with herself. And it was everything, all of herself. So for her, voice is a metaphor for self, and it unites body and self. And those of you who are as um, unsophisticated as I was, musicians have to have a body that is perfectly primed, like an athlete, perfectly primed to do that which they need to do. Uh, whether it's playing a violin or singing. Everything has to be, the body is part of the voice or the instrument. They meld. <clears throat> okay, so now, as a grounded theorist, I start defining what loss of self means and what it symbolizes. So it symbolizes more than bodily losses, although those are certainly important. But it's certainly the ways that people know, define, feel about themselves. And with the loss of self, you feel like your foundations are crumbling. What you had taken for real, for stable, for your structure of life, gone. <clears throat> and it certainly alters how one compares oneself um, to others and locate themselves in the world. And so, some of you might know an athlete, say from high school, who was really good really good, and then had a terrible uh, car accident. When I was an occupational therapist, I worked with a very young baseball player who was slated for the major leads. At uh, 16, people said, David is so good that he's going to make it. And then he was in the back seat of a VW, uh, and the driver went too fast, and he became paraplegic. Everything he had hoped for prepared for, saw in the future, gone. Uh, it's, it's devastating. <clears throat> so people lose their way of being in the world. Um, and they can lose their personal world. David, of course, no longer fit in with the athletes. And Teresa uh, no longer fit in with the singers. Okay, <clears throat> so it's like having a vice. When you anticipate this future, and that's what you're moving for, and it's so important to you, she felt like she was going to die, um, or maybe would need to kill herself. Um, <clears throat> she said it was so miserable, and words can't explain how awful it was. So the shock of, of losing 
that kind of having that kind of loss so early and so unexpected, it just amplifies the suffering and the feelings of loss of control. Um, and uh, <clears throat> she was very brave, I think, at 19 years old. She was shunted for two or three doctors. And the, then when she went to the surgeon, he was angry. And she said she couldn't understand why he was angry because she didn't say anything or do anything that would elicit, elicit that kind of anger. But then it became clear the other doctors had let the surgeon tell her the bad news. And when he asked, she's 19 years old, and when he asked, don't you want your mother to come in? No, she didn't. And then she fell apart. She knew immediately cancer wasn't as frightening to her as not being able to sing. So, <clears throat> and she had, you know, not just the feelings, but her voice was croaking. She could barely talk. And just think if you've been a singer and you now you're talking like that, how difficult it would be. So there's a lot of sorrow and a lot of shock when these kinds of events happen. And this is the surgeon when he told her, you may not be singing anymore after this. She felt like she had just been shot. <clears throat> but then the surgeon said, we're gonna do everything we can not to be too intrusive. However, she couldn't talk after the surgery. Okay, so there are conditions contributing to this kind of overwhelming loss. Certainly, the lack of a anticipation of loss. When you get to be my age, it's not so surprising. But uh, at 19, at 19, with a healthy young body, uh, people don't expect um, this kind of event. <clears throat> and at the time, she was absorbed in immediate but minor um, trouble. She thought it'd be interesting to have her first surgery for because she thought it was for a goiter like the first two doctors told her. But she was losing the most defining attribute of herself and her identity, how she was known to other people. <clears throat> this is what she said about the thyroidectomy. Um, <clears throat> it was just strangest, my first surgery, weird. And that's, so it was kind of a trivial event, interesting but trivial. And then she learned it was not trivial, it was life-threatening. <clears throat> now I thought it was really interesting. She had immediate awareness of the implications of the potential loss. And she experienced a total loss of control at first. And of course she saw her life's purpose dissolve, it just went. So she has an objective misfortune here, and it's made all the more, has all the more impact because of the subjective meaning of what she's losing. Now I'm going to compare it to um, Teresa's situations with that of a woman we call Gail. And Gail, perhaps like one or two of you, or maybe more of this audience, were brought to campus as an athlete. She was, uh, had a nice scholarship at her university as a gymnast. And what happened to Gail is that she was very, very good in high school. But in college, she wasn't considered to be that good. <coughs> However, she worked very hard, developed her own routines, and had made the team. Um, and this is what happened to her. She missed um, a leap. Um, in her routine, and she's falling. And she said, that moment takes forever. Then she heard this crack, or was it a tear? Sounds like Velcro. And then she found that something felt very, very wrong. She couldn't feel the bony part of my arm. The Velcro sound was from my elbow, and then it hit me. Look what happened to me in a split second. How disappointing to have a, what looked like then a very serious injury when you've just made the team. She was devastated. Okay, <clears throat> so comparing that with Teresa, uh, one of the things that I came up with that I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about is that 
Uh, for Gail, it very soon became known that she would recover, that she would recover function of her arm. But with Teresa, she has this ominous threat, uncertainty over her life from thenceforth. And this is how um, she described it. She was interviewed by a graduate student who happened to be quite religious, and he was going to get religion in there. Uh, they were at um, um, a religious um, university, uh, founded on religion, so it's not surprising. <clears throat> okay, um, she could, and note, she said, I was a fat kid with no friends for as long as I could remember, but I could sing. And that was the end for me. When I lost that, I lost my connection with God. I lost all my friends. I lost my calling in life. Singing was her calling, her passion. Um, <clears throat> that was her trump card. So she was going it was the thing, her ticket out from her oppressive dad and being that fat kid. Um, so everything's gone. Okay, <clears throat> now, discerning loss was not difficult for either one of these young women. It was there. Uh, Therese had audible signs of, of loss. Gail heard the cracking of her elbow, and it's something I think she'll remember till her dying day. And certainly visible signs of, of loss. Teresa has this incredible gash where the surgery occurred. Um, that's always going to be there, even if she doesn't say a word. <clears throat> but both of these young women have a finely tuned sense of their bodies. Many of us in the United States don't. Um, we separate our bodies and ourselves, and we treat our bodies badly. But um, these two young women are very in tune with their bodies, and they have visible symptoms. But one of my analytic points is the speed, clarity, and form which was, with which the news is imparted matters. Teresa got the bad news at first from the surgeon, and then it was very visible after the surgery. Um, and certainly Gail, by witnessing her arm. <clears throat> okay, and she too felt that life had lost some of its purpose. <clears throat> her teammates were really um, helpful, and she felt horrible. Um, and still a little shocked how this could happen, and the routine that she had so worked so hard to perf uh, perfect. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned, Gail has this disrupted self, and Teresa fails, uh, faces loss, permanent loss. Um, <clears throat> so they both um, result from misfortune, and they cause distress. And here I'm looking at a number of different people in their situations. And this kind of immediate loss imposes changes in daily life. What I discovered, and this is something for you to take home, is that <clears throat> often when people are in the hospital, even if they have a very severe injury or, say, a stroke, they quite often don't realize that they've become disabled until they go home and start things. Now, it can be an invisible situation, like a person with a, a heart attack, like several men that I talked to found that they couldn't mow the lawn anymore. Uh, one man talked about where he always parked to go to work. He couldn't walk across the parking lot. So these are less visible than, say, um, the young geologist. Geology is a field that a lot of people have injuries in. And he had a terrible fall and became paraplegic. And he said he was going to get up and walk again as long as he was on that striker frame in the hospital. But when he went home and realized that the only walking he could do was with parallel bars and long leg braces, it began to sink in. But for months, it didn't because he was in the hospital for months. <clears throat> okay, so these two young women are particularly interesting because they intentionally uh, work to reconstruct a valued self. Now, I know other people, like one, um, I knew her as an undergraduate, then I knew her as a graduate student um, at another university um, in Sonoma. 
And uh, she had no particular intention to reconstruct herself. She sort of fell into it. She decided she uh, didn't want to uh, spend the rest of her life smoking marijuana, so she became a good student. But it was a, a medication, a new medication that just turned her life around. Uh, for, some time, for some folks, it's a surgical procedure that wasn't known earlier, and they're a different person. So, <clears throat> but these two young women really worked on making a comeback. Gail and uh, Gail's coach and her teammates were incredibly supportive, and they worked with her, and they pushed her, and you know, she not only made the team again, she became captain. And she felt that was an incredible uh, victory for her uh, and an incredible tribute to the work that everyone had done to help her make that comeback. <clears throat> so she did reclaim the valued identity. But for others, it does mean relinquishing the past self. And in Teresa's case, her efforts to make a comeback failed. The night before her surgery, the person she saw last was her voice teacher, not her mother or her father, but her voice teacher. And she admitted her voice teacher was kind of a father substitute for her, that all the students loved him. But uh, he had become very important in her life. And she had described herself as the voice student that everyone was jealous of. She got recitals at 19 that the graduate students weren't getting. Um, all the instructors wanted to work with her. Uh, she was considered to be quite prized. <clears throat> but in Teresa's case, uh, there was a point where her instructor said, her voice teacher said, why don't you stop coming? And so she did. So she wasn't able to do it. And <clears throat> she had been the student that everybody envied. And then she became a pariah, someone that everybody distanced themselves from. So, and she said she had to endure every instructor calling her into his or her office and then philosophizing about how sad it was that such a young, talented person was struck down so early in life. And at 19, having to deal with other people's thoughts of death is pretty heavy. Um, and I thought pretty um, uncalled for. They might have called her in and talked with her about what her concerns were, but no, they talked about what their concerns were. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but she was a student. And being the sociologist that I am, I just can't ignore the fact that she had parents who could afford to keep her in college, who supported her financially, and she had the opportunity to change majors and go into another field. Not everyone would have that. A single mom, for example, with three kids, has got to go out and work. So there, the structure of people's lives has a lot to do with what happens about reconstructing a valued self. And with Teresa, um, <clears throat> she said she could have done without seeing so much of her dad when she was in the hospital, but he was very attentive and uh, her mom was always attentive. Um, <clears throat> her mom was always her champion. And uh, that kind of support is something that not everyone has. Certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, people that um, are single and in midlife often don't have that kind of support. Okay, now did, when Teresa said that Basically, everything was gone, and all of her, all she was was her voice. Did I believe that? No. I did try to capture what it must have felt like in my paper, that the experience, to capture that experience. But someone who had been so systematic about what she was doing has some skills, has some ways of acting in the world that can serve her very well um, in making a comeback. And although she didn't make a comeback, she had this persistence. And she talked herself about being willing to struggle 
and fight against poor odds. She always saw her dad's view of her singing as poor odds. <clears throat> and also she learned to temper her emotions, to go into a rational way. Like she immediately, at 19, brought the surgeon into a partnership with her. How are we going to handle this? Um, skills that a lot of folks don't have when they go to Kaiser or, or um, <clears throat> Sutter Health or wherever their health plan is. Uh, but she was able to do that. Okay, what do we need to do and how are we going to do it? So she took an active stance and she persevered. And she talked her, about herself as relying on logic and rationality. Gail also persevered very systematically to regain function of her arm and to uh, make the team again. So um, Teresa discovered that she had an audible voice beyond being a singer. And I do think it does mean convergence of individual factors and social circumstances. You might see her as a heroine and that's very natural, but it's also that silent social support in one's position in society that can allow these things to happen or help them flourish. Um, and she did relinquish the past self rather than holding on, which must have been very hard. So one reaches a point of readiness for change that allows relinquishing that past self. And I believe, it's my analysis, that when her voice teacher told her, why don't you stop coming, that that pushed her. Uh, she discovered that she had a mind. She never saw herself as smart before um, all this happened, and she discovered she could hold her own with the intellectual crowd. <clears throat> um, and there are some contributing conditions. You'll find that a co-author um, sees the way in which she compared herself with musicians as more negative than I did. Um, but when people make a decision or when things happen in life, and some of you might think about an old boyfriend or girlfriend, oh, he wasn't so great after all, oh, she wasn't as pretty as I thought, whatever. Um, but they redefine the situation, the relationship, the person. It's very, it's very typical, and social psychologists have found that a lot. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, she talked about the musicians being sort of superficial compared to her new intellectual friends in psychology and other fields. And Teresa and Gail had a long history of being autonomous. They both sought achievement. And they both knew how to manage time and to persevere towards their goals. They both knew how to manage resources. Those are real skills. We can learn them. A lot of us don't. I still have trouble with time management. But um, you can learn them. And like so many people with cancer, Teresa had a heightened awareness of time passing. So many of my people that I interviewed over the years who knew that they had a potentially lethal diagnosis tried to cram as much as possible into the present because you might not have a future. Um, one woman um, who's in her 50s had cancer, very serious uh, cancer with metastases. So she felt like the um, actor, the doctor, and the fugitive. Some of you saw that film where he's running, running, running. And that's what she felt she was doing. She was trying to pack everything in. Um, that's very common. A young man I interviewed here in Sonoma County, I had a um, devastating diagnosis. It was hereditary kidney disease. And he really packed activities into a very short amount of time. And he did die at 37. So people feel a felt pressure to live a full life in less time. Now I'm going to give you a little bit about practical uh, the handling of these kinds of materials. OK, so this is. Um, a coding, qualitative coding. Qualitative coding is a way of labeling, categorizing what people say. And with the grounded theory approach, we work from inductive data, 
We work from the ground up to a more um, abstract analysis. So I'm taking her statements, and I took Gail's statements, and I took some uh, comparative material from my own interviews, and um, <clears throat> I looked at what I was seeing. It's not the end all by any means, um, but I was really interested in this voice and self verge, and that became very early part of my analysis. And certainly losing a valued self was part of my analysis. Um, <clears throat> acknowledging loss, which you can't see, is also part of my analysis. So I'm just going through this interview or these stories very quickly and putting labels on them. You'll notice I'm using active, uh, um, their gerunds, the noun form of the verb, implying distress, defining permanent loss, experiencing forced loss, um, losing the value itself. Some of them are more abstract than others, and that's okay. Because with grounded theory, you go back and you check it against other um, data. Okay, so grounded theory strategies foster analytic momentum. You move faster, quicker. Um, I am a very slow writer. I do acknowledge that I'm very slow. And it was so telling to me. I was the first one to get a draft of the paper done, not because I'm any kind of wizard or anything like that, or a fast typist, because I'm also very slow with that, but it's because of grounded theory, because I found two processes, losing and regaining a valued self that I just traced out, and I had a paper. Um, it fell together really quickly. Doesn't always, but it did then, and uh, that was, that was really telling to me because I was working with these very sophisticated, very um, knowledgeable, skilled, talented psychologists. Um, <clears throat> and their chapters are quite wonderful. You should read them. <clears throat> okay. So this is how I analyzed it. You saw the earlier. And uh, I'll re this is what we call an early memo or part of an early memo. Memo writing and grounded theory is getting your ideas down, just exploring them. Ordinarily, memos are for your eyes only. I'm sharing an early memo with you, although I don't recommend it for other people. Um, memos should be for your eyes only, and you develop them. Your memos can become parts of your paper, your senior project, um, sections of the analysis, and really, then you fit things together and you've got a paper much more quickly than when you struggle writing from the beginning to the end. And as someone who teaches writing, I always recommend that you write your introduction last um, and your conclusion uh, next to last. <clears throat> Get that analysis down first. Okay, so I say perhaps we see the self of the 30-year-old woman become again the 19-year-old girl who faced losing the only self she had known and valued. And she really resonated that in her chapter. She said that my chapter was so posit had such a positive view of her that it wasn't how she was used to seeing herself. And that wasn't the case with all the chapters. <clears throat> and not surprisingly, she resonated the most with Fred Wurtz's, but he had been her teacher. Um, and so she had a personal relationship with him. I had written the paper before I met her. I met her and I interviewed her for about four hours um, at a, an APA meeting in, in Fred's hotel room. But um, none of that is in the paper I wrote. And it's available for you thanks to the generosity of Guilford Press. <clears throat> okay, so I say meanings of time permeated her narrative and the past, present, and future take on intensified meaning. Um, <clears throat> The assignment that happened in Fred's class was that everyone had to write about an unfortunate event. This was way more than unfortunate. This was tragedy, a devastating tragedy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I thought she was telling a tale of devastating loss and of regaining a revised but valued self. Okay, so not only grounded theory, coding, memo writing, data collection strategies help you to move analytically, they also foster theoretical development, developing actual theories. And this 
it's just beginning to be exploited. In the um, December 2014 uh, issue of American Sociological Review, which I occasionally read, but not very often, um, David Snow and his student Dana Moss have a, an article about a theory of spontaneity in social movements, and they use these techniques looking at social, across social movements, including the ones they were in themselves, and they develop this theore theoretical treatment of spontaneity, which is very useful, incidentally, for activists, being able to seize particular moments and move on them. Um, David, when he was a young student in the Kent State riots, did it spontaneously, but he learned, and through the comparative approach with grounded theory, they teased out this theory of, of how that occurs and how other people can use it. <clears throat> okay, so I, um, I do have a, a picture for you. It's the only picture you're gonna get. And this is thanks to the help of a computer science student, which I hired. I don't have the programs or the ability to do that on Microsoft Word. Some of you might, but I don't. And what I've tried to, do, um, to portray here is the relationships between uncertainty and certainty, and losing and then regaining that value itself. Uh, you may not be able to see how I um, developed the conditions. With regaining a value self, I talked about making a comeback, drawing on past lessons. Both these young women that I've talked about had lessons from the past that they used in the present. Um, they did things to try to reduce uncertainty, and they worked at realizing their dreams. Um, <clears throat> so, this is my diagram of how they work to effect an intentional reconstruction of self, which is exactly what they were both doing. Uh, Teresa's value itself became something else. And for her, the first step was relinquishing the past self, but drawing on those lessons, drawing on those skills, and discovering that she had an audible voice in a new field, that her, her voice could be heard uh, among psychologists and among psychology graduate students. And then, of course, she had to learn to live with uncertainty. And she worked towards realizing a revised dream. Not the dream she first had, but a revised dream. <clears throat> okay, so I'm putting loss of self and regaining a valued self along a continuum. And I'm putting certainty and uncertainty at at the backdrop. So loss of self does make life uncertain and chaotic, and regaining a valued self fosters this sense that life has become more manageable, more predictable, that you have more control. We Americans, we like to have control over our lives. That's really important to us. And we may feel very much at odds with the world and ourselves when everything seems chaotic. <clears throat> okay, so regaining a value of self implies then that the person's reestablished a stable self-concept, although it may be based on new attributes and values than an earlier one. From a social psychological point of view, uh, the self is always in process, and yet some attributes and values about ourselves we take to heart and define it, that's who we really are. And we believe that we have an inner life. Some of my colleagues, like David Silverman, deny that, <laughs> and think the self is just a, a presentation that we give here and there according to the situations that um, uh, come up. But I see the self and our inner life as being a little bit deeper than that. Okay, now this is Gail's sense of, of accomplishment. <clears throat> and she's continuing to strive. Um, she really felt that working and being, being competitive uh, made her, made something of her, she made something of herself and it became her legacy that she had done this, a way of encouraging her to move on. 
Um, and I think this is really interesting, feeling like, okay, for a cancer patient, I'm kind of doing okay. I'm doing stuff. And there's that feeling of being active, proactive in the world, trying to be um, a person that one uh, has a lot of self-respect for. <clears throat> and here again, that she's um, being able to, to interact with the intellectual crowd, as she calls them. Um, and I like this last sentence. I can sing my own music now, so I'm a singer in an entirely new way. Okay, so a few words about um, how we can see data. You can see the data that I showed you in, a, in many different ways. I happen to see it as testimony to losing and regaining a valued self, but there are other ways to see it. You can use data to learn, to ask new theoretical directions. <coughs> um, certainly I advocate attending to multiple voices in, in the data. Actually, we only had Gail's voice, the surgeon's voice, and Teresa's in the few excerpts I gave you. But in uh, a full-blown study, you're likely to have other voices. And you might do things like, I talked with a number of caregivers, about 15 caregivers, when I did my study with chronic Ill, chronically ill people, as well as people with chronic illness. And I did talk to a few health practitioners, but I was much more interested in what happens on the ground, at home, in the community, uh, rather than in the institutions. There's a lot of studies of doctor-patient interactions, and I wanted to find out how people live their lives because one is only a patient for a very small part of one's life, even if one, say, has serious heart disease. You're a patient when you go into the doctor or on the phone with the nurse or something like that. But other than that, you're a person in the community, a person in, uh, in relationships and families, et cetera. <clears throat> so um, you can recode data with a fresh view and pursue new lines of analysis and new theoretical directions. Now the next three slides I have to get, you can't see it, but I'm giving Sage um, Publications credit for allowing me to, to reprint these. It's the first time I've been able to show these and have them actually taped. Okay, so here I'm coding what the surgeon said. Can you see that? It looks awfully light. Uh, okay, I'll read some of the codes I have. The surgeon's forecasting a grim, grim future. He's imparting ominous news. And then with Teresa's response, there's a shortening of time, immediate awareness, and a collapsed future. And then when the surgeon, uh, she says the surgeon said um, that we're going to save your life, though. The other surgeon's working with me as a voice guy, softening the news, softening that bad news. And then with Gail's excerpt, she's feeling, when she's coming down fast, she's feeling the moment last, then she's hearing the impact, she's experiencing the gap between sound and feeling, and then uh, when she couldn't feel that bony part of her, her arm, she's feeling her injury. And later, just a little bit down, that Velcro sounds from my elbow, she's sensing horror. And then, uh, then it hits me. Look what happened to me in a split second. She's realizing what happened. Okay, you wouldn't think comparing a person with injury and illness would be uh, a good comparison. But when you're thinking about... Um, let's see if I get that. So part of it um, is visible to you. When you're thinking about the properties of comprehending the ominous moment, and the ominous moment can cut across other fields. It can be like when you know that moment when you realize your partner's going to die, or that your baby has a really serious disability. That moment, that moment of realization, what happens? And in these cases, with these sophisticated people who have an integrated body and self, <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> They're perceiving rapid successive cues. So speed and timing matter. 
they're realizing instantly the meaning of those cues. So you have instantaneous awareness, despite shock. You have shock too, but you still have that instantaneous awareness. And then there's this self-defined turning point. The person realizes it. Not everyone realizes it. Um, I probably am a post-polio person, and I know I have weak arms, but I was a graduate student reaching up to get something from a shelf before I realized that I can't do those things. I literally cannot do those things. My realization was much longer because I was able to operate in my own world. And that quite often happens with people with chronic illnesses and injuries that don't necessarily obviously interfere with their lives. <clears throat> but with these two young women, you have the shattering of the self because that incident strikes at the core of self and identity. And you also have that immediate awareness of consequences where it foretells the future. They know. They know. It's going to be very different and maybe not good at all. Okay, thank you for listening. And we can discuss it if you wish. I guess I should stay close to the... Yes, so we have time for questions or comments from the audience. So um, we have about 10 minutes for that. So um, if you have a question or comment, um, feel free to um, give them now. Yeah, I, I already, I'm very much struck by the uh, point you made seeing data. About what? About seeing uh, data anew. That is, uh, the thought that comes to my mind is that in conventional research, among the primary concerns is that of the issue of internal validity. And what, at least the way in which I am understanding your point is uh, seeing the data anew is the essence of the induction. And with regard to induction, then, internal validity is actually, uh, I hate to say irrelevant, but it's not the bottom line consideration, actually. What, what is of significance are those theoretical implications mm -hmm. that are inductively generated. Yes. So I can, and also just for what it's worth, put it in different terms, uh, a rejection of so-called essentiality. There is no essential essence that is, uh, at least, at least uh, in the data, as you, see, as you say, uh, the data can be approached uh, with new eyes. Mm -hmm. well, let me add a couple of things about this. I so often get emails from people on research teams, they're using grounded theory, and they're very concerned that all the coders come up with the same kinds of codes. And I keep telling them, if you have an outlier coder, pay attention. That person may have more insight and see different things than the rest of the team. Um, so it's, it's really important, and with grounded theory, you go back to the data and see if your analyses hold up. Uh, and that's, uh, that's part of the, the um, I think, the strength of the method. And then you pursue other theoretical directions if it doesn't hold up. But I think it's amazing what you can gain by doing this independent coding and seeing what you see, and then does it, and if it's not what Noel sees, that's okay. <laughs> maybe in a senior seminar, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Kathy, thank you for your talk. I, um, I really appreciate your insights on yourself, and, and as much as I've worked with you and read your work, I learned something new again today, both about the self and about grounded theory. So I'm going to ask you a question um, on behalf of people in senior seminars who might not know they have this question. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> the issue of grounded theory is, um, it's all about comparison. Mm -hmm. Comparisons in the data. It's comparisons of experiences of other data. And for students who 
writing their senior SEM paper, who are looking to do analysis now and have only their own data in front of them, what would you recommend to them about strategies for thinking, stretching their thoughts about codes? Because you and I and James and Cindy and Melinda and Noel and others in the social department have other data we can think about and think through. And, and make comparisons with. What would you recommend for the students who are just starting to make those comparisons? Well, first of all, um, I imagine a number of the students have, what, about 10 interviews? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can do a lot of comparative work with the fragments between interviews. And I hope that some of you have been able to do coding early so that you can ask more questions about your code for later interviews, so that they can do some comparative work. And I have to tell you that one of my disappointments with qualitative research is that in so many fields, the dissertation's becoming a research, what I call a research exercise, rather than an extensive project. So I have people from a number of disciplines who write me who have 10 interviews. And I actually had one um, supervisor, dissertation supervisor, write me about a month ago from a university in the UK asking if her student could do grounded theory of one focus group. That's mighty thin. Very, very thin. Focus groups are very useful for certain types of questions. But with a grounded theory approach, I recommend having more <laughs> groups and possibly doing other data. One of the things that's interesting about grounded theory is it can lead you to different kinds of comparisons. For example, um, I think it may go beyond the work of a senior seminar, but some of your students may be exploring areas in which people have written autobiographies. And if they've written an autobiography, say that they're really interested in the lives of baseball players, uh, there may be some really nice autobiographies by professional baseball players, often written with someone else, but that kind of thing, um, that they could do some comparative work with, perhaps later. Uh, and I would recommend that you do develop as full a project as you can if you're applying to graduate school. It really can make a difference. In the past, I've actually had a few students who have gotten jobs because of the strength of their senior seminar paper that um, they uh, gave the paper to a future employer and they were so impressed that they hired the person. So uh, it can be an entree to not only exciting ideas, but very practical applications. Um, as an anthropologist, I often uh, use uh, a somewhat grounded theory approach as we're working through our journal notes and experiences during the day. But thinking about this comparative effort, most of you will have been reading many different other cases elsewhere. And so, as part of your literature reviews, um, you should be finding places where you have some data to compare with, because that's linking you into the ongoing dialogue, the, 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 you know, the, the academic conversation. And so, um, I, I will be doing it in two directions. Sometimes I'm focusing on the discourse folks because I'm a language guy, but sometimes I'm just looking at more general ethnographies. And so, especially in, this, in the the sociology that has ethnographic components to it, I have found that um, the grounded theory works great with ethnography. It, it's, it's a complementary approach to the long time living with the people and working with the people as a participant observer. But you can take the insights from the ethnographic um, understanding of their worldview and then get these kinds of interviews that will focus and pull out the patterns. Because ultimately, grounded theory is um, based on pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Try to bring out the patterns, and that's why different mm -hmm. observers will see different patterns. Nice point. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for all these years. Well, I learned the that. The honest edition. Okay. Um, I do I actually talk about this. What was really so striking to me is how much those philosophies of science, 
even if they're very implicit, or tacit theories of knowledge came to bear in the way in which we analyze things. Now, one of the things that um, you may not have picked up about sociologists is that, and I think this happens with ethnographers too, there's just this quiet, tacit rule that you don't judge the person. You try to look at the situation. Um, you don't come in and you just try to understand what it may be from that person or that community's uh, point of view, that you try to put yourself in the, their place. And I think that came through in my work. And Rosemary Anderson said when she read my chapter, she um, almost la uh, burst out laughing because it had none of those deep psychological definitions that uh, psychologists love to put on uh, cases. And it was much more straightforward in that sense, but I don't think straightforward is the right word. Um, it was just very different, that I wasn't looking for psychological categories. And she picked up on that. Uh, Fred Wirtz, um, initially, he saw my um, chapter as being very much in the, uh, in the uh, structural tradition that I was attributing a lot of things to structure, like the family structure, uh, an immigrant family, um, a family where the, the daughter's the second generation is this quite common, had very different approaches and a world view that was very different than our parents. Um, a very different view of what it meant to be a woman in the United States than perhaps her mom had. And uh, he saw those kinds of sort of structural issues, uh, which were there, but there was also the interaction between the self and the structure in which one came from and the structures in which one had to operate. Are there any more questions or comments? I think we have time for one more. Any other students want to? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, well, from a kinesiology uh, sport and exercise uh, framework, I, you know, um, you know, I met you my very first year here, and um, you shared with me, um, you know, basically you taught me how to do qualitative research. And um, I think what, as what you just said, is that you really, um, you know, helped me understand that to not take things from a psychological or a discipline perspective. Mm -hmm but rather that everything we want to construct meaning out of it and how has this individual constructed meaning out of it. And that you've provided so many of us with the, with the tools to do that. And I think also expanded uh, psycho psychology, psychology, other disciplines. Um, so many psychologists early on were trained um, as uh, paradigm sci scientists uh -huh. and got very stuck trying to prove that psychology was a science. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to be objective. And so you really helped me understand uh, subjectivities uh, in getting to meaning rather than trying to use that uh, old, stuffy, scientific psycho psychology paradigm. Which is still very prevalent. It's oh, yeah. It's very prevalent in my field of social psychology, um, and sociological so social psychology as well. People like Noel and Melinda, Deborah, and I, who are um, much more fluid in our approach. Did you have a question? Uh, you mentioned, uh, I believe it was Teresa in the last two ways, that she came from a more family, and so she had the resources to be able to switch from her field of study and be able to make a comeback in a different way. And that the importance of that and the importance of I wonder if you had a lot of opportunity to explore um, people that may have experienced a loss who didn't have that access. If you were able to explore that a little bit. Um, I did because I think it was a little bit. Because most of the people I interviewed were in mid to later life um, because I was interested in chronic illnesses and so many of them dropped off at that time. But uh, yes, uh, life a struggle. And for one younger woman um, I talked with, it was an incredible struggle. She 
much easier to go on that now. Um, <coughs> the social services were very sympathetic to people who had cancer. So she had, um, she had really good care. And she happened to be in a very affluent county, although she was a very impoverished person. And um, she was young, she was attractive, she was personable. But I think the staff really liked working with her. And that's a resource. That's an asset. And I think they gave her all that her. She took on it. But they did it not. So we bring different resources. Because this young woman, she was selling used clothes at the flea market to survive. Um, her dad helped her when he could. Her mom was not affluent. And her mom was off in another state. But came when she could. She did get some help from her dad. And he's been um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for coming.